This man here, his name is Dr. Hi, Jim everybody. <laughs> this is fun. This footage is from a talk he gave on this channel last week. I want to tell you about this task that I use. This is the hand-holding task. It's the fruit fly of my laboratory. And what I do is I bring dyads to individuals into the laboratory and I put one of them into the MRI scanner and while they're in the scanner I show them a red X or a blue circle over and over and over again and the red X indicates a 20% chance of electric shock and the blue circle indicates total safety they know they're completely safe when they see that blue circle and what that allows us to do is look at the difference between shock threat and safety in how their brain is functioning. Now we do this under three different conditions for every person that goes into the scanner, either while they're alone, while they're holding hands with a total stranger, or while they're holding hands with a person that they know. It turns out that these three conditions produce very different kinds of neural activity in the brain, particularly in the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is this large area of the brain right here underneath your forehead. It's responsible for a lot of things, and one of the most important is emotional regulation. Basically, our prefrontal cortex can calm us down. What we found was that when you're in a brain scanner and you're under threat of electric shock, your brain gets pretty busy dealing with that potential threat. And what they further found was how busy your brain got depended on your social environment. Here's a map of the activity of five different brain regions while under the threat of shock. For each different region, there was significantly more activity while they were with a stranger or when they were alone than when they were with a partner. Basically, when you're with a partner, your brain doesn't have to work so hard to calm you down. Simple handholding with a romantic partner actually decreases activity in regions of the brain tasked with processing somatosensory signals related to pain, as well as the emotional components, what we call sort of the suffering component that goes along with those more somatosensory signals. What this means is when you're holding your partner's hand, the electric shock is genuinely less painful. So the conclusion tentatively here is that supportive presence regulates threat-related brain activity. And if you're like my mother, you don't think this is that surprising. When I told my mom this, she was like, well, how come you're getting so much attention for this? You should have called me. I knew already that hand-holding when you're stressed out would make you feel better. And she has a point. So we don't need an MRI study to tell us that it feels good to hold hands, but we do need one to tell us why. So why? Why does it feel good? Well, before we can answer that question, we need to take a brief diversion into hill climbing. Why don't you come with me? In a recent study, it was found that participants accompanied by a friend estimated a hill to be less steep when compared to participants who were alone. What they did was they brought people to the bottom of a steep hill, and then they asked them to estimate how steep it was. Then, they asked people to estimate the steepness of the hill when they had a good friend with them. It turns out that when you're with your friends, you don't think hills are so steep. Why would this be? Well, according to Jim... This study suggests very provocatively, I think, that we construe our social resources as bioenergetic resources, as resources that are available, if you will, to our bodies for doing work. Now let's go back to hand-holding. They did another study where instead of the threat of shock being to the person in the MRI machine, like here, instead the shock threat was to the human who was holding their hand. This is the lateral prefrontal cortex. This is that region of the brain that is very commonly regulated by hand-holding. And here on the y-axis in both of these graphs is the percent signal change in this region attributable to threats directed at the self. And on these x-axes, you have percent signal change in that same region attributable to threats directed at the friend on the one hand and the stranger on the other hand. And what you'll see is there's this nice positive correlation between threat to self and threat to friend in the lateral prefrontal cortex that doesn't exist at all when you're looking at people responding to strangers under threat. This is really interesting. What's interesting about this correlation is that I'm responding as if my friend is myself, as if my friend is going to experience things the way that I do. Bottom line is that we think that the other is non-trivially encoded by the brain as the self. The other is encoded by the brain as the self. One paper, Cohn writes that, that the dominant ecology to which humans are adapted is not any one terrain, diet, or climate, but rather each other. Over the millions of years of human evolution, 
we developed an instinct to assume that we would be supported by the people around us. And the way that that works neurologically is for our brains to construe the abilities of our loved ones as our abilities. One of the ways that we may be able to actually define familiarity is that the person or object that comes to be felt subjectively as familiar, that that sensation of familiarity is the sort of grafting of that person or thing onto our brain's model of what the self is and what the self can do. So at this point in the video, what I should do is give you a nice clean definition of the self. But of course, I can't. We've been trying to figure out what the self is since before history began, and we like we won't figure it out until history ends. But what I can do is tell you one thing the self isn't. The self is not some membrane-bounded entity. It is not the equivalent of my body or even my mind. What this research shows is that whatever the self is, it's extendable. Selves only exist in relation to other selves, and we need each other. That is, to be human is to be connected. Hey, before you go, one more thing. There's a link on the screen here to Jim's full talk, and there's also a subscribe button in case you want to watch more videos like this one. And I'm also going to leave you with a quote from one of his papers that I thought was particularly interesting. Take your time reading it. I'll wait. I got nothing better to do. And let me know what you think in the comments. Alright, thanks for watching. Bye!